<laughs> hey everybody, Melissa Harmel here, Realtor with EXP Realty Alaska. It's episode two of our Home in Alaska show, and I am so excited to come to you today and talk with one of my favorite Alaska mortgage loan professionals. Hey Rhonda, how are you hey. today? Hey Melissa, doing excellent. Well, great. So today's topic is understanding why you as a buyer need your mortgage professional to be your partner in today's crazy, crazy real estate market. Yes, yes, I agree, I agree. So Rhonda, question number one, can you share with us, well, first of all, how long have you been doing mortgages in Alaska? So I have been doing mortgages for over 38 years in Alaska. And I can tell you that it's still one of my favorite things every day to get up, put my feet on the floor, go to work and be able to say yes to a home buyer that we can actually get them into their home. It is just the most honorable job I can think of. And you've been doing this a long time as well. Got my license in 1998. So yeah been selling yeah. doing the real estate in the in, in the industry for not as long as you but at long <laughs> long time long time you've seen a few cycles <laughs> yes so in this crazy market we're actually seeing buyers and sellers agree to purchase price is well above what we list them for yes. so today what we're going to talk about is what happens with appraisals when the buyer and seller agree to an above list purchase price. Okay. And so basically my first question for you is, how does an appraiser establish value? So this is kind of an interesting question, Melissa. Can I share my screen for just a second with you? Oh, please do so. Okay. I want to show you, this is what's in every single appraisal report. And it's kind of the guideline the appraisers have to use to come up with this value per Fannie Mae instructions. So if you look at this actual um, description, then it says the most probable price which a property should bring in a competitive and open market under all con conditions requisite to a fair sale. Now, garbledy gook, right? So a lot of times the appraisers will say, okay, so it's a fair price. Buyer wants to buy, seller wants to sell. That should be what the market price is, right? But there's more to this that a lot of times appraisers don't kind of continue reading the rest of the rules, which says that the buyer and seller are each being acting prudently, knowledgeably, and assuming the price is not affected by undue stimulus. Hmm. Well, we've got kind of a little bit of unbalance in our market right now where there's not a lot of homes for sale but there's a lot of buyers wanting to buy a home so there's a little bit of out of whack stimulus going on so it says implicit in this definition is the consummation of a sale um, as of a specified date and the passing of title from buyer to seller under conditions whereby the buyer and seller are typically motivated or we're a little out of balance there we've got more motivated buyers and very motivated sellers as well. Both parties are well informed and well advised. And I believe that, yes, we have a lot of really great advice going on between our realtors and the mortgage lenders. So giving everybody good advice, I think that is accurate. And each acting in what he or she considers his or her own best interest. So I think that that's an accurate statement. But the third one, a reasonable time is allowed for exposure in the open market, is not something that's happening right now, right? So I think that you had a listing recently that had a lot of activity. Do you want to talk about that? So I did. I put a property on the market last weekend, um, or last Thursday, at 1245. And by Saturday evening at 8, it had 37 showings scheduled. I always do a mega open house on all my new listings because I feel like 
the typical buyer today is a working family. And oftentimes they don't know that I'm putting a property on the market by on Thursday afternoon. So they might have plans Thursday evening, Friday. So I always want buyers to have an opportunity to come and take a peek at the property. We had 75 people through an open house and we had 18 offers. And we did that all in a three day time period. And we mm -hmm. cut it off by Saturday night at eight, because at that point, you know, the goal was not to see, could I cap it and get 50 offers? That seems ludicrous because then you get buyers that are kind of disappointed that put an offer in on Thursday night or Friday. So we capped it at Saturday evening. And yes, there were offers well, 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 well above list price. Right. And so this is the challenge that the appraisers are having right now is that they're trying to meet this guideline of what is a true market value. And Yes, buyer wants to buy and seller wants to sell for X dollars, and that is somewhat of an indicator of market value. However, the appraisers have to substantiate that value and validate that value by using what the rest of the market has been doing over the last two or three months. Right. Well, when the appraisers go and look at comps from November, December, January, those were a little bit slower months in our market right now. And so those are the comps that they're using to compare this new home to. So even though a buyer may feel like it's worth more and wants to offer more, the appraiser may not be able to support that sale. Now in the next few months, what'll happen is those sales will be reported and just the sales price, not the appraised value, is what's going to become new comps in the future. But right now we're dealing with older homes. And so we might not see those market values come in at what the sales prices are. So next question. So basically with the offer that we took, my sellers took on Sunday morning, there's a gap between obviously what the list price was and what, what the seller agreed. So we we went way up in value. And now, of course, looking at all those offers, one of the things that I wanted to make sure of is in how does an appraiser or what happens when an appraiser comes in and let's say we agree to a $450,000 price? Well, the appraisal comes in and says, well, guys, based on history, the last 90 days, because there's enough market comps out there to support a value of 90 days, we're 25. We don't, he, only, he or she only brings me an appraisal at 425. What happens when there's that gap in agreed upon purchase price and agreed upon or what the appraiser comes back and says the house is really worth? What happens there? Yeah. So there's kind of three different things that can happen. One buyer can agree to pay the cash difference. So remember, when we do a loan, if a borrower wants to buy a home and say put 5% down, it's a 95% mm -hmm. loan to value. But the value is the appraised value or the sales price, whichever is lower. So okay. if the agreed upon sales price is 450 and the appraisal comes in at 425, from a lending standpoint, the value is 425. So we're only gonna loan 95% of the 425. The buyer has to come up with that cash difference. Or the seller could agree to reduce the price depending on how your contract is written, or the whole deal can be canceled. Buyer and seller can say, forget it, I'm not selling for that low amount. Buyer says, forget it, I'm not paying over appraised value. It all kind of depends on how you write that contract. So I think that you taught me that, that um, knowing that they're offering more than the appraised value, you might write something in there that the buyer agrees that they're gonna pay that cash difference should it come in low. And then the sellers are okay with that. They don't care what the appraisal comes in at. Buyers do because that determines how much cash they need to bring in. But depending on how the contract is written, those are the three options that could take place. Okay, so one term I came up with, and I think it's a standard term, I hear a buzzword in the industry called the appraisal gap. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you would call that, right? The get, there's, there's a gap between what the purchase price is and what the appraisal value is. Right. 
So what is the best way for buyers to establish they have the funds to cover an appraisal gap? Right. And I have seen this um, happen several times here recently where they want an extra verification from the lender that sufficient funds are verified by the lender that you have the funds to close. The sellers may require a copy of your bank statement to show you have the funds on deposit and verify that you're a valid borrower. Um, now, those funds, sometimes people say, oh, my gosh, where am I going to get that money from? And so it can just be money that you have in the bank. If you don't have it in the bank right now, it could be a gift from a family member. Um, you could tap into perhaps your retirement account with a 401k. You could say like you own your vehicle free and clear. You could borrow against your vehicle, prove you're um, approved for the loan. So there's a lot of different sources where we can document those funds to close. But a buyer needs to be prepared to prove they have that cash to fill that gap especially if the contract is written to where they agree to do that. Well, and what I found this last week was I four offers were substantially higher than list price. So because you and I had done this last year with a buyer and we verified that they had the funds to cover an appraisal gap because they were just done home shopping and they said, mm -hmm. we're buying this house. We don't care. We'll write an extra trek for $50,000 because we don't care. Right. So I reached out to four buyer's agents and I said, please reach out to your lender, your buyer's lender, and get me an updated prequal letter that says not only does the buyer have the funds for the down payment, they have the funds for their own closing costs because obviously we're in a market where sellers are rarely paying buyer's closing costs right. and the appraisal gap and only one buyer's agent was able to produce that. The other agents didn't understand that and thought that the $99,000 that the buyer had in the bank was gonna be enough to suffice, but the buyer wanted to put 20% down. Right. And by the time you pay 450, 20% is 90,000. If you only have $99,000 in the bank, you've got money for your down payment and your closing cost. And we had this much for an appraisal gap. Exactly. Yes. So are there any loan programs that prohibit a buyer from paying that appraisal gap? Like I had heard at one point, like, oh my God, VA buyers, FHA buyers, nobody can ever pay over the, you know, purchase price and they can't pay the appraisal gap. Is that true? It is not actually. Oh. Um, this is a, uh, um, a guideline that, I mean, it's been coming up more and more frequently. And so we actually did the research on this just very recently. And so far... I have not found any loan product that prohibits you paying over appraised value as long as you've got that cash. But again, that's on the lender to verify you've got enough cash for your down payment, your closing costs, and the gap, and that we're not going to totally wipe you out with nothing left over. Well, because sometimes as a lender, you, you want to make sure the buyer has some reserves. Set aside. So when they close, they can't take their bank account from $99,000 to zero at closing. Right. That does make you guys a little nervous, right? It, it does. And, you know, moving is not cheap. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, hook up your utilities and, and buy curtains and maybe you don't have enough furniture or you want new furniture or washers, dryers, refrigerators. I mean, it's just expensive to move. And so we don't want you to ever be in the position of being 100% flat broke just to get into your home. So let's leave a little okay. cushion in there so that you've got a little bit of, of breathing room. So are you having conversations with buyers right now about this appraisal gap mm -hmm. scenario that we're seeing in the market? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times, you know, one of the biggest challenges that I see is the funds to close. I mean, it's just a challenge. It's hard to save up that kind of money. It really is. Mm -hmm. And so having enough funds to close is, is usually one of my number one challenges that my folks have. So I really want to make sure that we address this right up front and that we talk about what happens if that appraisal comes in low. And we talk about those three different scenarios as options. And boy, if they agree to pay that higher price, whether the appraisal comes in or not, you know, it's just something to really be prepared for. So right on day one, as we're talking about payments and closing costs and down payments and cash to close, 
we're having that conversation of what are you prepared for if that appraisal comes in low so definitely a great conversation to have with your whole team your realtor and your lender right up front on day one and so what i think is kind of a sad thing that i went through here was i think there were two buyers that they had they had you as their mortgage lender i think they would have known that going into this crazy frenzy last week on this one property and they would have been able to take care of that appraisal gap however their agent didn't address it in the offer their agent didn't address it after i texted and emailed and so consequently I, I, so that is why the name of this particular show today is your today in this market, you have to have a mortgage professional partner. You have to have somebody that's there with you. I know that one agent could not get hold of their lender that weekend. And so that buyer did that, was that buyer able to do something possibly, but again, the seller didn't have that information. Yeah. So I think that having that conversation up front. And again, then that, that means that the real estate agent and the buyer is partnering with you to understand the buying process. And I'm not saying that every buyer should be primed to do an appraisal gap. I'm never one that people should pay more for a house than they're comfortable paying. Right. However, I think that that's what makes you such a great partner in this business is that you are addressing these things right up front. Yeah. Because we didn't talk about this two years ago, Rhonda. This would not have been a conversation we had with our buyers two years ago at all. No, we would have we would have said two options. We would have said the seller will come down on the price, or yeah. you cancel the deal, um, right. or the seller will reduce the amount of closing costs they're paying on your behalf to right. cover that difference. And we were doing that because two years ago, sellers were paying closing costs for buyers. Right. right, right, absolutely. Yeah. So another shift in the market, and that's you know a great thing about having some experience behind you as you've been through a few of these these uh, cycles and it's forever shifting and you need to be able to pivot and turn and advise very quickly as this market is shifting and so i think that that's another important feature for home buyers to be looking for is is some kind of past experience to know when these shifts are happening and be prepared ahead of the head of the curve a little bit well and also too it could be that that one buyer that i explained with the ninety nine thousand dollars he could have gone with a ten percent down payment on a loan and been able to do that. Right. But again, that particular agent, that buyer and that lender were not partnering that weekend. Right. They weren't in partnership. And so, um, and I can tell you honestly, cause I think what, I was at a seller's house on Sunday and I picked up the phone and called you and you answered our questions cause she's leaving the state and moving. And we had some questions about getting her pre-qualified somewhere else. And you were super like, boom, answered the phone and said, yep, this is what we need to do yeah yeah and and i think that that's the important thing is that there's so much going on and so many moving parts these days in this whole process that it's really important to have everybody working together i mean it doesn't it doesn't do any good to kind of try to get one over on anybody else or pit each other against each other i mean you got to work together on this thing to make it all come together for the sake of our clients our buyers and our sellers right so yeah. that, that's the important part is our our clients are what's important so finding solutions to whatever the challenge is is the key to making it successful for everyone true so Rhonda thank you so much for sharing and if you guys follow me here on YouTube our Instagram or wherever you happen to be watching this I'm a big believer in making sure that we share information so that you as a consumer can make a super great decision on how to purchase real estate. Yes, I agree. And so this, Rhonda and I do these shows weekly. So you can always subscribe to my YouTube channel. We're gonna be answering common questions that you guys have and have shared with us. And then things that Rhonda and I find back and forth that we end up talking about during a week. And we think, wow, that would be a great thing to share on a show. Please make sure that you put comments in below if you have questions because you maybe don't understand what an appraisal gap is. Please put that in the comments below and we'll be happy to answer. Also at the end, 
of this video is contact information on how to get in contact directly with Rhonda or directly with me. If you have any questions, just let us know. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And remember the new buzzword right now is appraisal gap. <laughs> so I'll see you next week, Rhonda, and you have a good day. All right. You too, Melissa. Thanks.